Photoculture. Back at it again. It's Photoculture Podcast. You got me, Exotic Rose, Lisa Marie, and Clark Stefan with me. And we have a special guest here today, Shay Ryan Douglas. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on the show here um, and have a conversation, chat about a bit about the culture and share a little bit of insight from Australia here. And, um, yeah, real honor to be here. It's like 10 o'clock right now, 10, 12, something like that? Yeah, exactly. Saturday morning, 10 a.m. Wow. <laughs> wow, it's already <laughs> Saturday. Yeah. So go ahead and give us a little background information. I know you're from um, Australia, but you... I guess you got a, I don't know if you want to call it a scholarship to come play football down here. And then yep. you ended up in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So once I finished high school, I was 17 years old and I was really fortunate. I was super passionate about playing uh, soccer. As you call it in the States, we call it football. But I decided to yeah follow that passion and go and play in the States and was offered a scholarship at a university in Milwaukee. In Wisconsin and um, yeah never looked back really I, I went over there said goodbye to all my friends and my family and and everything that I knew here in Australia and and decided to embark on a bit of a new life adventure and and a lot of people at first I was kind of like expecting it to be very similar to Australian culture because I mean we watch a lot of American TV we watch a lot of American <laughs> movies and I had a, a pretty good insight but I was culture shocked you know after the first month living in Wisconsin one, the weather started to get really cold and I'm from a tropical part of Australia. So I, I was dealing with battling with the weather and even a lot of like subtle um, differences in the way that we communicate. And I was a little bit kind of amazed at um, how similar it was to some of the movies that I had been so uh, familiar with. And it was a bit strange for me because I, I, you know, I thought that was just in the movies and I guess there are stereotypes for a reason, but it was also interesting to get, you know, get to know the people on a deeper level. And everyone that I, I came across in, in the States were really, really open, really warm and really welcoming to me. So they made it a really smooth little process to, to find my feet in a new place. And um, I began to really enjoy it living in, in Wisconsin and um, found and connected with some really good people. And um, I ended up staying for four and a half years. So I lived up in the Midwest region mostly. I got to travel quite a lot and, and would spend the summers over there and would probably go back once or twice um, every couple of years to see my family in Christmas. But um, that was a whole new experience living in the United States. And um, I learned a lot about myself. I was an extremely young age and um, I kind of went off on some wild paths which led me to go down a spring break one summer down in Florida where you guys before are. We, before we get there, before we get there. <laughs> Okay, okay. I, I know that whole story, but um, before we get yeah. there, um, I heard that you had a, a car called Green Hornet with a hole in the ground too when you was in college. That's it, man. You know it. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> my first, uh, me and my buddy, he's from the UK. He's English, and um, you know, we I was on a scholarship, so I wasn't earning any money, and I was just living off, you know, the the um cafeteria food and living in the dorms and stuff and we decided to scratch around what money we had in our bank accounts and buy a car and I think we spent maybe like seven hundred dollars and it was this little beat up green car that we we called the green hornet and um yeah it was pretty beat up little car but it served its purpose it got us from a to b you know we were able to get down to the bars and have a drink in the evening or go down to the soccer fields and do some extra training and um yeah it it served its purpose but it was a little bit shaky at times and probably very <laughs> unsafe <laughs> i had me my first car was a 1994 a honda civic the same one that was in fast and furious and oh wow i'm surprised that I even got to where all those places i went to i used to have my girl in the car and it should be like you could feel the vibration the rocks like i know what you're talking about i think we all been through with our first car That's, it was pretty yeah. crazy oh yeah <laughs> It's my bad, Clark. You had a you had a uh, Mercedes, guys, your first I'm car. Just, sorry, an Audi. It was a Beamer. No, but anyway. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we don't have the opportunities like you. <laughs> so yeah, so you went to that, and then um, you ended up in spring break, and you actually was on a documentary on Netflix. Yes, I saw you. I literally <laughs> watched it because of you. I did like I seen it, but I never really paid attention or clicked on it. I didn't understand it. But after watching it, I see the purpose of the whole 
the whole documentary, and I actually liked it. And I actually liked that you allowed yourself to be shown like that in that view because you're actually a changed person now. And go ahead and give us a little background on how you went down to South, uh, not South Beach, uh, Panama, right? That's where it was at? Panama City. Panama City Beach. Yeah, Yeah. Panama. Yeah, so go ahead and give everybody a a little summary of why you went there and how you got there. What made you guys drive down here to go see to the there? Yeah, totally. So this is back in 2013, you know, um, young Australian, um, just looking to have a good time. Got a, got a couple of weeks off at university and me and all my mates, we decided, you know, we would go and experience what this whole spring break phenomena is like down in, in, um, in Florida. And we had done a spring break in Milwaukee before, which was fun and we had a good time, but we were like, let's go to the real deal. Let's go to the big party. You know, we're just like college students looking to have a really good time. And so we all like got our money together, hired a car and decided we'll go down for a week trip, a bit of a road trip, 16 hour drive from Milwaukee all the way down to Florida. And um, yeah, it was cool because I was with a lot of my really close university friends who primarily were from England. And um, we were just looking to have a good time, you know, see what this spring break thing's all about and go and have a bit of a party. And and in Australia, we have something similar. Once we finish high school, it's called, we call it schoolies which is essentially a big celebration for graduating. And I had, I had a thought in my mind, you know, it would be something similar to this kind of concept. And so we got there and I was completely blown away, you know, like 20,000 people all partying on the beach. It was this wild. And we were at that time, we were just like, yeah, this is awesome. Like this is every college boy's dream, you know, like plenty of, uh, plenty of good looking girls, plenty of drinking and drugs and plenty of partying. This is like, amazing we were soaking it up and instantly we were just like yeah getting into the vibes and out to all the nightclubs drinking loads and yeah we, we were really enjoying ourselves and it was about day three where we came into like we crossed paths just by synchro destiny with this film crew who just happened to stop us in our tracks as we were going to this other party we were just hanging out by the pool and having a few drinks and they they asked us like, "Oh, do you mind if we um, interview you guys? Is that cool? Like, we just have a couple of questions to ask about um, what's going on here." And so we we kind of stopped and they started asking us some questions about sex and about um, what we're doing and how spring break is for us. And we were loving it. We were just soaking it up and we were giving each other so much banter. We were just bouncing off one another, and they kind of really liked that about us that we had this kind of camaraderie within the group and we had an ability to kind of take the piss out of each other and just like accept it and, and forget about it. Cause we, that's what we did naturally. Anyway, we would always kind of like pick on each other in a, in a sense that we would keep each other in check, but just have a laugh with it, you know, and they kind of liked that. And so they, they kept on filming us and they wanted to follow us around and they were like, Oh, do you mind if we come to the party tonight? And we're like, yeah, yeah, come on. We'll show you what it's like, what spring break's all about. And, and then next thing you know, we had this whole film crew uh, with their cameras, their light men, the sound guys, uh, all of the little ladies who were like getting everyone to sign consent forms and da, 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 this whole crew following us around and getting us into, you know, the nightclubs. We were skipping all the queues. They would pay for our entry. We'd buy us drinks all night. And Damn, we were just they like, gave, yeah, They made we, you guys sign a consent form? Yeah, every, everyone signed a media release. Yep, yep. But yeah, but I thought at that time, the people that was recording you, they weren't that big at that time. Or they were, yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, they were really small, yeah, actually. That's well, why I'm surprised because usually big companies do that. I didn't, I'm mm. sorry, I'm surprised well, they, if they do that. If production companies want to sell it, though, to anybody, like a network, they have to get consent forms because then they got to go hunting everybody down so that way yeah, they but sign it. That wasn't the goal at that time, though. The goal was they were just recording it. They didn't know they were going to sell it to Netflix till like, later on because I'm pretty sure they reached out to him, Shay, like, five years later, you said, something like that? Yeah, exactly, yep. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. got to reach out to you. At least they found you, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was super fortunate. They, um, we were able to stay in contact. And at the time, you're right. Like we, we, I was kind of looking at these guys, and I was like, "Yeah, there's no way that they're going to release a documentary on Netflix. Let's just <laughs> go and have a good time and see where it takes us." You know, we weren't thinking about what's coming down the line. But um, so we did. At least that. it was we authentic, just, though. Yeah, it really. Because if you would have like, knew, if you if you knew that it was going to be on Netflix, you probably would not say certain things that you said. Absolutely. Or, or do certain <laughs> things that you did. Yeah. Because you thought, because in your head, your heads are like, man, this is not going to air nowhere. This is going to stay between uh-huh. us. 
Yeah, exactly. And that was always the plan. Like we were always we, between us guys who were, who were filmed. We were like, yeah, we won't tell anyone about this. Yeah, it was filmed, but it's not going to come out. And it didn't for ages. And we kind of completely forgot about it for a while until 2018 came. And then we were quickly <laughs> reminded about that experience. <laughs> were you scared to watch it? Or did they let you watch yeah. it before it, before it came on? Um, before they released it, yeah, they were really kind enough to um, – show us a version that wasn't the final draft, but it was kind of coming to completion. And just to just, they were also really, really kind to like give us a pre-warning of what we can expect. So that right. was our opportunity to watch the film before it was released. And at that point, you know, I was just like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, it's crazy, um, man. It was crazy because I, I actually, you, you, you made me get, a, you made me give it like that, that documentary let me see a different point of view of things of life and how the culture we're in, like sex sells now, like yeah, sex is almost everything, like what's going on in our culture. And I seen in the documentary, how they said how you got Kim Kardashian who got famous off of uh, the sex tape. And it's crazy. If you think about it, like, damn, yeah. we're here lusting for like, like, especially little boys. Like, can you, that like that Panama city, like if you used to tell me like that was going to be there, like when I when I graduated high school or when I was in high school, I would have drove out there too. <laughs> I would have been doing the same thing Shay was doing, and I probably would have done the documentary, and I would probably would have been worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's crazy how our culture and our generation, and I I seen that um, I forgot where I heard you say this, but like there's not a lot of role models for men where men can go to and like talk to about certain things. Like it's just us figuring out on our own yeah you're totally right man it's so easy to just get swifted away in that culture that you know is kind of really hyper sexualized in a lot of senses um through media like through our screens and things that we're watching even the billboards like the the message of the film is um quite powerful you know because they they link they find the connecting thread from obviously the beginning stages of like just hooking up, you know, having that like kissing and one night stands and, and where does that lead to, you know, that leads to this idea that, you know, potentially that all of this coercion and, and this entitlement of males point of view from, okay, let's strip it back. It, it essentially is coming from the media that we're watching. You were watching on our screens the like you said, this idea that sex sells, advertisements of women in bikini or men having to, to be this proud guy with all of these girls around them. And it's, it's so obvious in, in our culture and in the West primarily, um, if, even in Australia, I've noticed that in a lot of places in England and Europe and, and a lot in America when I was there and, and the role of pornography as another um, media source and how it, it encourages, accepts and even celebrates this hypersexualized not just behaviors but ways of being um in the world you know so for me to right. to be a really masculine man i've got to have this really strong physique body and if i've got two girls around my arms yeah i'm even more of a man and yeah, you, you considered the man that's how that's how my mind of thinking was when i was in high school how much girls you can knock down you got a list you got a team uh a strong, strong physique or like you're, how famous are you in school? Like, it's crazy how we thought that that, that makes you a man. That makes you a man. Exactly. You're totally right, man. It's, it's really quite confusing time coming of age because I mean, for me, I was taught so much to learn about myself from my external world and the external world is telling me all of these messages about how to be a man. Um, to not be a faggot and, and not be a pussy and not be like this wimpy little girl, but be be a man, you know, sleep with all the chicks, be a player, go out and mm -hmm. do all this stuff. If you're not doing that, they think you, you're something wrong with you, you're gay or something. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's your point of view, Lisa, since you're a girl? And they actually show a point of view. That's like, I like that part in the documentary where they showed the guy's point of view first and then the girl's point of view. What's your point of view? I don't know if you watched it, um, Lisa. No, I did watch it. I just... 
I don't know. I was the girl that had one guy that I dated in high school and I waited till I was like a sophomore before I even kissed the guy, you know, or like lost my virginity or anything. But it was to that one person, you know what I mean? Like, and I didn't go on like a host spree. I had friends that did, you know, that they hooked up with guys all the time. You know, you would hear about things happening behind the portables or, you know, behind the building and the staircase or you know, whatever. But like, I don't know. I didn't hang around. Like, we're, I went to school of the arts too, so I feel like it was different in public school than it was in school of the arts because we all had like common interests. We all had goals. We all had things that we were like really structured about. We weren't. The difference was we weren't forced to go there or be there. We all auditioned to be there. So none of us, at least when my generation, I know like younger kids, like once I was in eighth grade, the sixth graders were like way ahead of us with like belly button rings and like all these things that I did not even like have then and whatever. But I just, I wasn't surrounded by that, but I did have like friends outside of school that were like that. Um, and I don't know, I think it is who you are, who you associate yourself with because, you know, and, and I think it's, also what you like my my mom was in the army so she was super strict like I couldn't watch MTV or BET or like I would be sneaking it you know to find out what the music video looked like and stuff like that so you know I definitely got like the strict end and I didn't super rebel in that sense that I like sneak out to go to like you know prom parties and stuff like that I was just about to ask you that but um, yeah of course I still have your car I never got caught yeah, but I did. I did plenty of rebelling. It just wasn't sexual rebelling, you know. But there were people doing that. But it's it is it's true. Like you guys, it is kind of like a number count. I remember like the whole papers where you had who was the hottest girl in school, and like girls wanted to be on that list. So it was like the shorter your shorts were, and the shorter the tops were. You know, the lower they were, it was like, oh, you got attention. You were popular. You were a cheerleader. You know, the cheerleaders wore the extra short spang, you know. So, no, I definitely saw both sides of it. I just, I personally didn't find the guy who was hooking up with 20 girls, the hot guy. I thought that was the nasty guy. But that is also my personal opinion. But I had friends that would go after the popular nasty guy because, you know, they wanted to. And I was a cheerleader. I, you know, I was around that and in the group, it just wasn't my personal forte. And I also, like I said, I dated somebody through high school, so it wasn't really like my thing, you know, but I mean, to each his own and you guys, I mean, it is what it is. You guys, it is the generation. I do think that there is a point though, where it is common sense, to be honest. If like there's guys and there is a girl like being taken advantage of or whatever the case is where, you know, I don't think it's something to boast and brag about. I think it's something that even though it is just a hookup or a fuck buddy or, you know, a one night stand, it's just, just keep your mouth shut. You know what I mean? Just like, keep it to yourself. They keep it to yourself. You guys high five later. But I think like the whole laughing and the whole joking thing or like the high five, like that guys do that I have seen, you know, at like parties and especially the younger these kids get. It's like, it's, it's not really cool when you do it in front of them because that doesn't make them feel any better about themselves. So in a sense, like the girl goes home and she feels like shit rather than like, okay, or, you know, it's between us kind of thing, you know, because you guys do have a number and a rapport that you try to keep up with, you know, or one another, or your friends or whatever the case is. So no, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't that girl, but I definitely did have friends that were those girls. And they would get upset and they would cry and they'd be like, why did I do that? Or, you know, they feel pressured. And I remember going, there was a, what is it? Island Jacks or something over here at West Palm that like, they used to have like a hot body contest and the girls would get on the bars and get naked. And you would have girls that would get like completely naked. They would spray them with water on like the little bar thing, whatever it was, the little hose, you know? So, you know, I, I don't know. And I would watch. I'm not going to lie. Like, we're all at the bar watching. You know what I mean? They're on the bar. Where else are you going to go? But it's not. I I wasn't on the bar. I think I did get on a bar, though, a few times. So I'm not going to lie. I just didn't get naked. You know what I mean? Shot, but I shot, do shot, like, shot, 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 Like, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. You have fun. But I don't think you have to, like, necessarily be sexual while having fun. Because I definitely yeah. did have my fun. I'm not going to lie. Like well, I did maybe, from bars and stuff, just not yeah. that way. <laughs> Chloe, you're pretty quiet over there, man. When you was at a magnet school or something? No, I went to a magnet school in elementary school. 
But, uh, um, no, I mean, like, the school I went to, both sides, like, everybody was active in middle school, man. Like, I'm talking about kids were, they were having kids in middle school, man. Like, wow. it was, it was, it's hypersexual. Like, you see people in the middle of class, they'll, they're, like, you'll see the girls sitting on the guy's lap during class. I do remember just t- talking on this subject was well, me and you when I was in, uh, we call it grade eight. So stepping into high school and I was about 13 years old and I was a bit of a, a, um, a later developer. So what I noticed at this time was a lot of my friends around me um, were developing quite quickly and maturing fast. And at that age, you know, 13 year old boys and girls are kind of physically going through changes where oh, for sure. I notice men's voices are getting deeper, yeah. um, their, their balls are dropping, you know, it's, their hormones are changing, stepping into a more mature person. And I, I remember sitting around the lunch table and kind of one of my friends came up to me and, and he started this whole conversation about kind of telling us how we had had sex on the weekend with this chick. And I remember sitting there thinking about it and everyone was like so amazed and they're opening their eyes and like, <laughs> oh my God, like kind of curious, like, tell me more about this, like sex. Mm-hmm. Like um, I really want to know more about it because we're 13 year old kids, you know, like it's not a conversation. We haven't even had sex education class yet or it's I'm no way I'm talking to my mum and dad about this topic. But as soon as my friends had experience, I want to know more and, and I'm curious now. And like I, I'm this young boy, I haven't even grown any, like barely any pubic hairs yet. And I'm kind of looking down there and I'm thinking this guy's already having sex, you know, and like, does that mean like, am I supposed to be doing that too? Or like what's going on? And, suddenly like in my mind and I'm just like have this curiosity like I just want to know more about it and and I've already obviously got some understanding that it's sex that makes babies and all of these things but I've had I've got no personal experience into what it entails and the pleasure that it can bring and like all of these things and what what it really means and so it's like instantly as a 13 year old boy I want to know more and I don't really have the the deeper understanding on like how to ask the questions to people who could offer me some answers or like how to navigate that kind of conversation. So it's like instantly I just jump on my dial up internet. It's like, you know, I'm like hooked into the internet now and it's like starting to find this like pornographic imagery of like sex and and what that is and trying to understand it a little bit more. And on a, on a, um, you know, it's an industry that's completely unregulated and it's totally free and accessible to anyone, anywhere, anytime. And it's like, obviously, the, the message that pornography kind of tells in, in a, a broad sense, obviously not everything, but in a lot of the porn that, that I see that's on the internet, it's, it's male dominant and it's all about the male's pleasure and it's about the female doing whatever she can to make him like come to his climax and sometimes it gets even brutally worse where it's like this triple double like quadruple penetration on this poor girl and and it's very um quite violent sometimes and for a young 13 year old boy who's trying to understand about sex getting these messages downloaded from the internet about how a relationship in its intimate level like plays out it becomes very destructive and it's 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 easy to see how that narrative plays out through the culture and the way that men and women relate to one another in an intimate environment in the bedroom or even in at a college party you know where the film leads to is this horrible horrible story of this poor girl who was literally um raped on the beach in broad daylight in front of Mm -hmm. twenty thousand people and it's 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 really quite scary and that's obviously the worst possible outcome of something like this. But again, initially it starts with, um, you know, the very beginning point, like what kind of conversations are we having around these topics? Like how do we educate the younger generations around the the way that they feel around sex or intimacy and connecting with others. And, and so that's why it's really cool to have this conversation with you guys and to hear, your stories and perspectives and, and ways that we can support one another and the next generation to come through to understand their role within their own community or school, you know? So I'm curious yeah, yeah, to hear more from you guys too. 
Huh? I, I think there needs to be more role models. I think women, we do have enough. We have the Me Too movement. You know, we do have a lot of things that go on. I don't think you guys do. Um, and I think that'd be something that someone should incorporate and maybe doing just because, like, you know, like I recently just saw there's a guy on YouTube, like a dad, and he made a whole YouTube channel dedicated to kids who don't have dads and showing you how to do things. Um, that fathers would normally teach you how to do, you know, like changing a tire or stuff like that, just for women and men as well who don't have dads, you know, so I think definitely having somebody to incorporate that maybe to just kind of shed light on, you know, their experiences or, you know, just to kind of give you a little guidance or something, you know what I mean? I just feel like you guys, I do think guys also deal with like the whole sexual abuse and stuff like that also. And I think that gets swept under the rug. I don't think that it's just women that are victims of that. Um, so I think that you guys feel more embarrassed about talking about it than we do um, because we're trying to get our message across that we're women and we empower one another and we feel like we have to say it. I think with, you know, men, you guys feel more like you're, you know, demeaned because of it and, you know, it doesn't, you're not, you don't amount to enough if you say something or you're in what you said, like a pussy or whatever. Like, so I think, you know, there needs to be, you know, some sort of, you know, light shed onto that and somebody to give a little bit more guidance and people to kind of come out more with, you know, the same thing, you know, like you're a young kid, you don't know. And honestly, like, I'm really open with my son. So I've had the talk. I've walked in on it. I walk back out, you know, like it is what it is. You're a 14 year old kid. You know what I mean? But I definitely have had the talk. I definitely make sure like we are very open with one another. Like you have ideas, you've got a girlfriend, like, okay, you're going to her house. All right. Door stays open, you know, things like that. But I'm not going to sit there and also be oblivious to the fact that like there's thoughts and there's, you know, questions and whatever, like your kid, it is what it is. We live in a world where social media and phones and kids aren't always like monitored and you know parents don't always look at their kids phones either so you don't know what the friends are sending because sometimes it's not even your kid you know it's who they're hanging out with and you know what they have that they're exposed to what their parents allow and don't allow and then you know they bring that to your children or you know you're a friend of somebody and I had plenty of friends where their parents would let them do whatever they wanted to do you know what I mean I would go over and they'd say okay sure go wherever and I wouldn't even know that their parents were home half the time that we were there and we're maybe like 12, 13 years old, same thing, you know? So I definitely learned plenty of stuff, actually most of it from my friends and my peers, not from, you know, my parents. I just had really strict parents that I didn't have the balls to try shit. So <laughs> that's really what it came down to. But I got you a know, couple things I, to say to that too. Um, so I do see that social media and like TV, certain TV shows is corrupting people's mind and relationships too. Like loving hip hop and shows like that. Um, and social media, for some reason, I don't want to sound like, I don't know, my experiences with females and for some reason, females tend to, oh, they doing that, so why can't you do this, too? Or try to compare your relationship to someone else's relationship and see, exactly. certain girls see how that man is acting on TV, so they want you to act that way, too. And I feel like those TV shows and things like that, social media, is corrupting and polluting our minds. Because I can say that for men, too. Men probably do the same thing watching that, too. It, um, Go ahead, Clark. Oh, no, I didn't want to interrupt, but yeah, that's definitely, like, as far as with that, like, with the relationships and, be, like, sexual and, and so forth, I feel like everybody feels like everyone else is expendable when it comes to that. Like, oh, you're not going to do this? I can go somewhere else and do that. Or, you know, I don't... There's plenty of other fishes in the seas. One man, so. There's plenty of other fishes in the seas. That's what they usually say. That's what they keep saying, yeah. And, and, and that's, like, exactly what you said, Rosé, like... <laughs> That's what's portrayed out there. And as far as with the, you know, sexual activity and, and so forth with kids, it's better that, like like you said, Lisa, like, to be open because, like Shay said, it's very accessible and it's 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 free. And the kids will see that and they get a, a certain perception where certain things are okay. Like, like you know, like uh, as far as, like, sexual abuse, they the kid may think it's okay at that age, they're not realizing that that's just acting 
and they act upon it when they get older and it just it gets crazy at that point now it turns into something else so yeah there's a lot going on uh, and let's and, be real too let's be real though like us as guys uh we're we're competitive like can you imagine you coming to me or i'm coming to you and be like hey uh i need help in the bedroom or something like that or give me some tips or anything like that let's believe it women are talking about that more than guys giving each other help or tips and like that us as men we won't have that conversation because we feel embarrassed and we feel like our, our our honor like we feel like we're supposed to be the man we're not supposed to be going to another man asking <laughs> him for questions like that but best believe it the girl's mom is teach the girl's mom teaching the daughter that something or the girl's t- talking to her friends about it and they're learning some something sex about sex but while us we're not having that conversation we're not being open about it because you yeah, guys would rather really- look at magazines and google yeah. And I, yeah. Same. That's the problem with us men. That's the problem with us men. We need to be more sexually educated. You know what's so or crazy? Sex no, you need to be more willing to educate yourself on it. That's mm. what it is. You guys and, have to realize there's so many resources these days that like kids in this generation really have no excuse. Like you have all the resources in the world, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, as far as like what your perception is, like I said, it, it, it is who you hang out with and what you're associated with. But I think as far as that, like use Google, we use Google for everything these days, you know? I know my kids use Google for everything. They Google how to buy outfits, <laughs> you know? So I think, you know, you have to, I don't know, educate yourself. I'm always Googling, reading, ask questions. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's I, really. Good I don't. I don't mean. I don't know why you guys shouldn't like ask each other questions. I. I don't know what's weird about it. You guys can talk about like pounding it in and stuff, but you can't talk, talk about like what suggestions. That is crazy. What, we, like, could about, we could talk you know about. We could talk about knocking her down, but we can't talk about like if, if like if we didn't do something right or we want to learn something for some reason. Yeah, we can't that's have what that I'm saying. Like. I, I mean, I'm sure there's like a minute moment. I, I you guys have to have that once in once in your lifetime. So it's like you, you can't. You know, like, guys. Ask anybody or talk <laughs> they don't, don't, like, don't want to admit like, that. No, they don't want to admit me, that. Never that. Not me. Why? I do it for three hours. You don't have that. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but Shay, yo, Shay. So, like, I don't know how the you know the culture is over there in in Australia, but like you said, it's culture shock over here. So the thing is, as far as with what what Rose was saying and going to another guy, like you're not gonna do that. I'm sure it kind of would be the same thing over there. So to me, I don't know how it is in Australia, but over here, a lot of you know, you get a lot of people cheating, going behind their people's back and so forth. To me, I want I want to ask you how you feel about this. But to me, if if a guy asks another guy how to do certain things in the bedroom and they know that person has a girlfriend, right? So they're gonna be like, man, his girl is not being satisfied. Maybe not. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So he's gonna see, go like, see, that's just you guys being conniving. Yeah. No, th- no, no, I'm competitive. Just, it's the competitive and the guy. I think crazy. I think crazy like that. I'm sorry. I just, I think. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. No, but some I guys would do that. Some guys would do it. You're exactly. right. Exactly. Because I've seen stuff like that. I didn't. I never did anything. But how is it in Australia when it comes to that? Are people more open like that? Or are people more. Like, you know what I'm saying? How is it? Yeah, like that's that? a really good, um, that's a great question, man. And it's good insight. Uh, my experience is like the, the friendships that I have with my male friends. Um, I would never do something like that. But it yeah. seems that the conversation around sex isn't that kind of open or we don't go to those vulnerable depths about the way that we are really feeling and how it makes us feel. Like just from my experience, it's it's easy to talk about, you know, yeah, she's great in bed, but not share the the deeper insights into what makes it really good. Or even like if it's not going good, yeah, it's, it's hard to say to your friends, I've had this girlfriend for five years, but we haven't had sex in two. Like there's no chemistry there or there's no like harmonizing bond. It's really difficult for a male, I find, even for myself to openly admit to ultimately the, the flaws and the kind of vulnerable um, sense of humility to share that oh, I'm not I don't have it all worked out I'm not perfect and things aren't going good and just openly admitting that is probably the biggest challenge for for myself ultimately and, and for a lot of men that I notice and that's 
the sen- maybe what's limiting us to having these deeper conversations about um, what's happening in the bedroom or what's you know what's really going on inside of our in our in our minds and our hearts. So yeah, that goes both ways too, though. Girls are like that too. Yeah, yeah. girls are like yeah. That's very true. Yep. Oh that. yeah, women are that way all the time. They also sit there and they'll pretend like they'll send girls to go call your guy, you know, and hook up with him just to be conniving behind your back. It happens all the time. They're really, really grimy. Yeah. Hmm. Ladies, wow. I'll give you a little bit more background to the film as well. Um, leading up to that spring break trip, um, going down to where when Liberated was filmed. Just prior to that, I had um, made a couple of mistakes with my girlfriend who was from America and I ended up hooking up with um, an an ex-girlfriend and that brought our relationship to, you know, a little bit of a bitter and sour end, which is, um, you know, completely my fault. And I I messed up and made the mistake of, you know, getting led astray, essentially not being loyal to my partner. And... So that, that caused this ricochet of, you know, wild emotions out of uh, this, this woman who I, I hurt, you know, and, and she then um, attempted to get back at me and make me feel, you know, that same level of hurt that she was feeling from my actions. And so she went out to um, kind of manipulate and hook up and get with all of my closest teammates and my friends who were essentially my family over there because I had left everything behind in Australia and the people that I was closest to were those guys in, in my sports team and those guys that, um, that I was surrounded with on a daily basis who I would, I was open with and I shared a lot of things, um, with. And, and so then I got caught wind of like this, all of this stuff that was happening between my best friends and my now ex girlfriend. And suddenly I'm like confused as to what's going on and feeling this like really deep level of, Um, hurt and and betrayal and kind of at that point in my life just like throwing everything up in the air and going you know what to hell with it like I'm going to go out and sleep with as many people as I can too and I'm just going to go out and you know sleep with all the girls and try and boost my esteem back up to prove you know yeah like I'm I'm something I'm 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 a man and um, well see and I think that's where we all mess up because then you've got that one girl that does that and then you guys are like traumatized for the rest of your like next couple of years. Yeah, but but it was totally my fault. Like it, like if I hadn't made the mistake initially, like I've I've got myself to blame ultimately. Right. Like, and um, and I guess I didn't really where where I'm leading with this is that I didn't have the tools at the time to be able to to navigate these lusting sexual desires that I had that I ended up fulfilling um which had been kind of you know programmed into me from my teenage years where i was consistently uh watching pornography online where it was you know i would self-pleasure and and masturbate to some of these images that i'm seeing in in pornography and getting these kind of concepts around the way that men and women relate and where I'm going with this is that the the production um, crew from Liberated, uh, the Magic Lantern production team pictures, they're bringing out a second Liberated, uh, which goes a little bit more in depthly into the porn industry and the role that that plays in our culture. And it's super interesting. Um, we filmed when we were doing the screening of Liberated and there'll be elements of like a follow-up kind of thing with some of the cast from the show. And they also go a little bit deeper into the role of pornography and they explore with neuroscientists how there are certain kind of neurological pathways that have been rewired when ultimately you're coming to your climax, when you're watching something on the screen that you're suddenly having to get that dopamine hit and you want to do it more again and again and it becomes very addictive. Like you're going for that next you know, next more crazy thing, the next intense. And suddenly the things that you were watching initially are not fulfilling the, the lusting desires of what you're craving now. And so it like takes you on this pathway where suddenly things become very more physical, a lot more physical, a lot more aggressive, a lot more, um, you know, destructive in a sense. And 
And to get to that same level, like after it becomes such an addictive quality, actually to be able to climax and ejaculate, um, you have to, you know, go to these extreme lengths, which um, has been kind of put into our minds that we have to do to be able to seek pleasure. And so just by um, understanding the role of our relationship to where we seek pleasure, whether it's self-pleasuring or pleasuring with another person, you know, the role of sex has many, many different um, purposes, not just pleasure. Obviously, fundamentally, it's for us to procreate as humans, you know, it's to, we all came here from a sexual experience. And for me, that's why it's so weird that this whole topic of sex is kind of quite taboo in our modern society. And it seems I've been reading this great book. I highly recommend to a lot of people. It's called uh, the sex at sex at dawn. And it talks about the prehistory of sexuality and it looks at not just um, heterosexual relationships because they prove that in, in humans and in animals, um, homosexuality is quite common, you know, same sex kind of partnerships is very common in fact, but they look at, you know, this kind of, story of monogamy that we've institutionalized and become a part of. And it's super interesting because they, they date it. They go right back to when we were living in, you know, our primal times sitting around campfires and the way that we would um, build resilience in our communities by sharing these stories about how we can, you know, ultimately help one another survive at that time and also grow and become better people so that we can live harmoniously together. And, that that seemingly small group has that would maybe be a couple hundred people in a tribe has become a couple million people in a country you know and it's it seems very difficult to navigate a whole conversation within a country but i think what's really empowering is these conversations that bring it back to a localized level a kind of more individual level to look at how we can grow together and one of the things that when I do my research on these ancient cultures that still exist today, you know, there are in Australia, a lot of Aboriginal people, as an example, who are, are living in these more um, traditional ways. And, and even across the world, I've traveled to places in Asia and, and um, the Pacific and Vanuatu, which are very traditional in their culture. And, and one thing that I noticed that is prevalent in these indigenous cultures is this rites of passage or initiation that they have for young boys becoming young men. And I, I totally acknowledge that there is certainly a place for this for women. However, as a man that I am, I feel that it's um, not my business to talk about women's business and in, in itself, it would be a totally whole no another conversation. I've been fortunate to grow up with two sisters who I've been able to observe and witness their, their own process and journey on this, but just, in this conversation to focus on um, young men, what I notice in our culture at large is that we don't really have a kind of environment or a place for this celebration of when a boy becomes a man, you know, this, this rite of passage where it goes on this journey. Um, and even in the Aboriginal culture, they talk about going on walkabout where the young boy has to go out to the, is separated from their community. Go and, and this is the same kind of process for all cultures where they go through, the young boy goes through a, um, some tribulations, some trials. Sometimes it's going through intense pain of tattooing, um, some like experience that transforms them to be able to overcome these hurdles in life that life is going to throw at all of us. To, to push through the extreme adversity and actually come out the other side, not just survive it, but come out with more tools, more knowledge, more wisdom. And then to be a man, whether it's to survive in the outback when you're on walkabout, so having to hunt your own food, find your own water, build your own shelter, and then to come back into the community, to come back to your, your place of comfort that you grew up in as a boy, but come back as a man and be celebrated by the community for the transformational process that they've been on this whole journey and coming back to actually not just be a participant of the community, but actually to come back and serve the community as a, as a, as a man now and, and looking at what that entitles. And 
what I notice in my experience as a young boy in Australia and also experience in the United States is that this whole idea of a rite of passage or a um, coming of age kind of experience is absent. And even in today, you know, I'm 27 years old now and I, and I go into town and I'll go to the bar and whatever and, and I'll still see, you know, like men, well, actually boys in men's bodies and mentally, right. you know, like, and that's, how, that's what I was. I was this 21-year-old young boy thinking I'm something that I'm really, that I'm, I'm not and playing into this whole egotistical, self-absorbed mentality that is very much the psychology and the mindset of a young boy you know where it's all about me 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 look at me and um trying to look for validation essentially yeah rather and so i guess where i'm going with this is like a really nice question of how we can <coughs> move forward and integrate these really nice kind of settings and environments or what that could potentially look like to help young boys transition into that manhood kind of mindset and mentality and lifestyle for sure yeah i agree um i actually want to touch on what lisa said earlier too um i don't think you guys well, i don't think women understand the power of words like remember you was telling me how uh, uh shay was talking about how his girlfriend was trying to our ex-girlfriend was trying to talk to her friends to get back at him and how after that you were hurt and you felt like you needed to go knock down as much as girls you want to I've been to that. I've been to that phase in my life too. At one point, where I was so hurt that I was like, "The only way to fix this to me go, 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 knock down a whole bunch of girls," and it didn't solve anything. It just, uh, I just felt like, "Damn, I'm still hurt." At the end of the day, and men have fragile egos, so when a girl attacks our <laughs> ego or do something like that, it hurts us. That's so bad. that's what. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> Men probably don't want to admit like it, but I'm admit it. Not, I feel like you guys go off of that. What do you mean? Like you guys go off of your ego, you know? Your actions, your reactions, everything's based on an ego. I think I think there should be a balance to it. Um, because any guy that thinks he's like, he thinks high of himself is going to have some type of ego. But when you're a young boy, sometimes you feel like you're the shit, like you're everything. Nobody can stop you. You're on top of the world. And sometimes that can take you over the hill. And that, yeah. The yeah, crazy. Rose, why are you muting the background? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, what's crazy, yeah. <laughs> what's crazy is, is that um, I never really had an ego like that. Man. Like, I just never really, I don't know, try to go out and trying to talk to chick. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I do. Of course, I went out there. I but think I was it's like, a confidence thing, too. I think you guys have to, like, you are who you associate yourself with. So you're with a crew that's, like, mad, you know, into themselves, and they're really confident, and they know that they've got it going on or whatever. I feel like you're kind of going to ride that, too. You know, you vibe off of one another. I was around that, though. But, yeah, but go ahead. Then what happened? No, I'm just no, kidding. I just, <laughs> not like that. I've just never been like that. I just don't know what it is. I just no, never I been you. like that. But just, I always ended up with a chick, though. Because, <laughs> I mean, I always ended up around or ever ended up being with a chick because, I mean, I was different. I mean, that's just me. I'm not going to go out there and be like, yeah, yeah. Do like, you guys find no, yourself but doing you're, this you're, still? No, but Clark, your ego don't have to be just about girls. It could be about anything in life. Like, when or you play sports, yeah, you, think, you, you, think, been, yeah. you think you're better than that person when you're playing against them in sports. Or that, well, I mean, I mean, in this moment right now, yeah, of course. But, yeah, if, if it was, comes to cars and stuff, yeah, then, yeah, I'm on that. Yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. see? Yeah, you yeah, have an yeah, ego. You know. Don't act like yeah, you don't yeah, have an no. ego. <laughs> <laughs> cars and stuff like that, yeah, don't. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. But when it came to, like. But you don't find yourself doing that now, though, because you guys matured. Yeah. No, yeah, it comes, to, it comes with experience, sadly, that it comes, sometimes it comes in expense where, that girl can be the right person for you, but you lost her because of, like, if you would have knew what you knew now, you probably, maybe she was a perfect girl for you. I don't know. Sometimes you run into that. Or the guy, too, because sometimes things happen with, fit, well, I don't know. Shay could probably give us more details into that. <laughs> no one uh, yeah. I just... Yeah, I guess, no, nah, you guys are right. Like, it's our life experiences uh, that, lead us to who we are and and where we go from here like 
I think for me, it's the only way to really grow as an individual and as a person is to, you know, go through these series of trials and tests and these experience with different women and going through breakups and going through the hard times and coming out the other side to live to tell the tale, which is in its own sense a rite of passage, you know, when these, these people go out into the bush, they come back with this wisdom through their experience, whether it's through a heartbreak, you know, or whether it's through going out and surviving in the bush. Essentially, there's similar things where we go through this, you know, moment of pain and suffering and then are able to come out the other side to live to tell the tale but also live to learn from the experience so that we don't repeat it again. And it's something that I notice, like, and I think about like how potent these um, uh, intentional rites of passage could be for young men. And I think, why didn't my dad never do this for me? And it could have really helped me in my life. I maybe never had to go through all of those things that I did. And I think about it and I was like, well, my, my dad never had a dad. Like he was doing the best that he could with what he knew. And he was an amazing father. Yes. Well, I think our parents all make it a little awkward for you to have the conversation. My yeah. parents try to hide it from me for the longest. Well, yeah. that's what I'm saying. I've <laughs> noticed that. Like, that's why I am so, make sure to be so open just because I realize, like, I think that's where the whole problem stems from, you know, is the fact that they're so sheltered and don't want us to, like, know anything. So I find that they don't tell you, they don't explain it. So then you experiment. It's the same thing with, like, I, I know so many like little kids that'll smoke cigarettes and stuff, you know, their parents never taught them anything. They never talked about it. Even some of them that don't even do it, you know, their kids just saw someone doing it. So they picked it up. So, you know, I, I definitely think it has a lot to do with like your upbringing and your parents. Cause I don't think, I know my mom didn't ever talk about it ever. Like everything I learned was through everybody else. Yeah. So, you know, I, and I think it, it doesn't make you better or worse, but I definitely think that at least in my generation, um, yeah, no, my parents were not about telling me or explaining it to me or even like entertaining the idea of like any songs in a music video. So <laughs> like uh, that, no. So I, I definitely, that's why I make sure not to do that. So yeah, I, I'm, I definitely think it has to do with that. Were you, um, was your dad like the type of dad that like he worked a lot, so you didn't really, you didn't really spend time with him a lot? Yeah, no, I was like. I was really fortunate growing up. Like my dad was really good with us kids and um, he was really good with me, particularly as I was the only son that he had and he did work. He worked really hard. Like he's got an amazing business that he's had for 30 years and he, he worked really hard and um, he would always be sure to make time to do just father son things. Like when I was seven years old, an example, we went trekking through the Himalayas in Nepal. And when I was 14, we went up to Japan and went on a snowboarding trip, just father and son, you know, which are really potent times. But what I noticed was that my, what was going through my mind as a child, as a young boy, was that what I needed to do, the story that I told on myself was that what I needed to do in order to get love from my dad was to do, to perform, to do things like really well in sports, to, you know, climb the highest mountain, to be really good at snowboarding. And I would feel this level of acceptance from my father that he loves me, you know? And so I lived a lot of my life with this subconscious story and this, this subconscious mentality that I had to perform in order to receive love from um, a, a, a fatherly figure or role model. And so when that played out in terms of relationships and sexuality, it's evident to see in Liberator, you know, I was performing at a high level uh, sexually with a lot of women in order to get that acceptance from male peers and male role models. That's what I thought. This, this is the story that's playing out in my mind, you know, that I'm thinking I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be something, I'm going to be accepted because ultimately all, all young boys are just looking up to their father figures and, wanting to, and their mothers, you know, wanting to be accepted and wanting to be loved and, and supported. And another element to that is that, I also felt that I wasn't necessarily being taught the emotional understanding of how to navigate. I was excelling in the physical elements of my life, you know, very good at sports, very good at um, doing all of these things physically, but emotionally, I didn't really have the intelligence to know how to understand the deeper feelings of, you know, upset 
or hurt that I was experiencing as an example, a story that I'd share when I was 13 years old, I, I remember vividly that I witnessed my father with another woman and my mum and dad are still married at this point and I, and I capture him, I catch him in the act of, you know, hooking up with another lady and it, like instantly I didn't want to believe it was true. I was, I was like, wow, this, this can't be happening, you know, like my mum and dad are great together, well, what's going on, why would he ever do this? And so I wanted to investigate it further and the more that I went down that rabbit hole, I found out, you know, wow, this is actually happening and after a while I was super confused and I can see that my mom is not, you know, there's a bit of pain in the household now, my mom is finding out and, and finally I built up the courage as a young boy and I'm like, well, okay, like I need to, ha I need to talk to my dad about this, I need to tell him about it. And, and finally I built up the courage to go up and tell him and I'm like, Hey dad, um, like I seen you with that woman. And, and, and at this point, you know, I'm like, it's so much for me that I'm crying now and I'm trying to tell him what I'm seeing. And I don't know how to navigate this whole conversation because I'm a 13 year old boy, you know, and, and he's there and he's, I'm bawling my eyes out telling him that I seen him hooking up with women and, and like basically that I don't want him to do it. And he looks at me and he's like, son, don't tell anyone about this. And for me, suddenly I'm like, I just swallow all of the emotions that I'm experiencing. And, and from that point on, like I, I zip my mouth shut because I'm, he's telling me he's, he's this hero that I go trekking with. I go hiking with that. This guy that I look up to my father, he's like my ultimate idol as a young boy. And he's telling me not to tell anyone about this. It's like, if I tell someone, sure, he's going to reject me. He's going to kick me out of the house. You know, he's going to do all of these things that, going to make my life very difficult so sure i'm going to listen to him and, and do as he says essentially and at that point on you know subconsciously i had even told myself that i will never share my truth like i will never really speak what's going on inside me on an emotional level i will swallow all of these emotions i will bury them deep down inside of myself out of a fear that you know the male figure in my life and my father is going to reject me if I do. And so I lived my life like that for a long, long time until, you know, it resurfaced 13 years later and I realized, wow, there's some work to be done here in this relationship that I have to um, male role models and primarily my father. And, and it's like, okay, if, if, if it's coming up 13 years down the line and it's, it's still there, it's not resolved. So there's this, kind of unresolved emotional trauma that I've, I've been holding on to, how do I resolve this? And so it's just it's unraveled this whole journey of healing and, and um, understanding what it means to be a human, you know, and how to resolve this past trauma essentially. And yeah. um, I'm grateful yeah, that I can have the conversation now with my father, you know, in an open and loving way as men, as men together. And um, it's been really liberating actually. So it's really cool. That's really yeah. of course. I call That's that awesome. I, I call that the childhood scar or childhood imprint because uh, there's things that I see my dad that I look at sometimes now and be like, wow, I didn't realize that I was learning or getting some of that negative things. It, like it, it, it imprinted on me, and then it went towards my relationship, and I had to like check myself. Like, wow, I didn't even realize it. Hmm. Yeah, and I like that's also you know, like what Shay said, like <laughs> like there was something that my uncle would say too with females. He's like, oh, never trust them, never trust them. And he's married too, right? He's like, never trust. You know what I'm talking about? It's in the guy community. You know what I'm saying? He said, never trust any female. Bro, never, uh, my old father said that. that. Huh? My old father told me that. Tell you. Okay, and, hey, my dad told me never to trust men, so he was a cheater too. So. That's the thing. That's what I was going to get at. Most of the time when they say it, they were cheating. And the female or the, the significant other, the, 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 the opposite sex or whoever they, they were with was cheating on their partner. So that's why I think they said that, you know, and, and that just, you know, like you, like you said, Che, it, it causes a whole ripple effect. And then now you don't trust whoever you're with really at all. Like you're like, Oh, who are you texting? Who is, you know, this and that and whatever. Oh, you, dressing up now all of a sudden or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. So yeah, it does mess with the whole psyche and yeah, yeah. It definitely goes deep. Yeah. What, what do um, being a man means to you now? Compared, yeah, Cause I know, really cause I think, question. I think, um, I forgot what your answer was 
in the past in the documentary, but to you, you're a changed change man now. So what does it mean yeah. to you now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I like that question. And um, like I have the privilege today to work with the local charity here in Cairns where we go to schools. We have a school program set up and we, we talk about these subjects with young men um, who are coming of age and becoming young men in the world. And I get beautiful insight from these young men, you know, who are young, 16, 17, 18 year olds. And I get to learn from them and hear these, these wise insights into what they feel it means to be a man. And some of the things they share, you know, about uh, taking on personal responsibility, you know, caring for the community, looking out for one another, having integrity, being loyal to your loved ones and, and being, being honest and real and open with um, those in your immediate environment. And it's just so inspiring to have these conversations because what I realize is that, you know, all of this past emotional unresolved trauma has the potential to be completely healed. And that's the beautiful message that we can transform all of these, you know, old psyches of, um, that have been passed down to us. And we have the opportunity to kind of break that link in the chain and, and create a new future. And what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from these younger generations is a really powerful message that they are like so in tune with what it means to become a man. And, you know, like because these conversations are now instantaneously globally connected, more and more people, like Lisa mentioned earlier, the information and the resources are there. And, and it's becoming filtered into the mainstream, the messages. And people are waking up and realizing the potent potential that we have as human beings to really become true men in the world or true women and to, to come to a place where we are actually giving back and living in service, you know, not going in the world where I was a boy wanting to take, 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 but actually to give, give, give and give back and be you know, a member of the community in a way that is going to actually uplift others rather than bring them down and, and come from a place that is not just about me, but it's about what I can do for others and lift them up because ultimately that's going to lift me up as well. But doing it from a place of service is, is ultimately what I've come to understand as true manhood. That's awesome. Do you have a girlfriend now? Not currently, but I am hanging out with this beautiful woman who I really love spending time with. And, We're all like, um, yeah, it's at the beginning stages, so it's um, it's unraveling slowly, which is really nice. All right, Yay! what about um, what do sex mean to you now? Yeah, that's a good question too. I really like that, and sex has been an interesting point of topic as well for for me over the last few years because I realized, you know, as a young boy, I was exploring and understanding um, myself and what my body functions are doing through sex. And as I've gotten older, it's like it's become about uh, having, you know, seeking pleasure and enjoying another person's body and, again, mm -hmm. giving. And, and from what I understand, like in some of the conversations that I've had as we get older again, you know, like sex can be so much more. It can be about, um, you know, rekindling a kind of deeper connection with a loved one or like sharing things that words can't explain of how much you care for this person. And, you know, there, there are a lot of different purposes and meanings, I guess, to, to sex. But for me right now, what does sex mean to me? I guess on a fundamental level, it's when a male or a female or a male, male, whatever, like female, female come together and they're having this physical experience that actually transcends um, a deeper emotional experience between the two that just connects them and bonds them. It's almost like a way of communicating in like a way to share um, how much they really care for one another. I agree. Um, I don't be liking when I hear people say uh, sex, like I don't like when people make it seem like sex is supposed to be, all about the relationship i feel like that should be like i don't know like how can i explain it more into details like like i hear girls sometimes say like can you be with somebody if the sex is not good you're like, asking me or are you telling me what they say oh no, yeah, no, yeah. i'm asking everybody <laughs> like i, like, I, I want to ask i want to ask everybody first before i get into what i'm trying to say 
I mean, yeah, it is. No, I don't agree with that. Yeah. You don't I mean, agree with that, Lisa? <laughs> look, look, man. That's All right, what about no, no, what, no, no, what no, you no. want to say? Clark? I agree. I agree. That I agree. Is it's important, man. It's important, man. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that, that, I'm not saying it's everything. It's not everything, but it's it's important, man. You can't just sit there stiff and you waiting like, you know what I'm saying? Nah. nah it gotta be All like, right, what do you what do you think, Sean Shay? Yeah, yeah, man, I like that question. It's it's a for me, um, that physical connection has always been really important. And uh, I mean, I, I really enjoy having sex. I went through a season in my life where I was attempting to be celibate for a couple of years and, and not engage in intimate sexual activities. And what I noticed in that period of my life was that, you know, when I would have these kind of cravings to have sex I, and, and I was like, oh, I really need to have sex right now, you know, what I noticed was that I wasn't actually craving the sex so much but I was create craving intimacy I was craving connection and sometimes when I I would just be with a woman and I would actually you know just like surrender into their arms and they would like massage my head and just like tickle my face or something that was actually enough and I was craving more of this like just intimate connection just to like to let go and, and to be there and be fully present and and that was enough for me to like get over this kind of illusion of a craving that I had for sex, but really it was just to be, to be intimate with someone and to be connected with them. And that's what I was missing. And that would kind of fulfill that, um, that desire, I guess. So there is a part of me that, yeah, I do value, you know, that next, that physical connection through a sexual activity with a, with a partner. Um, so I don't think it's the be all end all. I think no. it, for me, it's more important, obviously, that we're able to connect on an intimate level. And and for me, intimacy can be like, you know, singing together or like reading right. a book together or just sharing experiences. Ultimately, so um, yeah. You just so answered. Think. You just got to where I was trying to get to because Clark, when you said you need that sex to be good. Do you no. know that it's the it's I mean, the it's the, it goes to your head. It's all in your head. So if you if you have a connection, it 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 makes it even better. Yeah. Anyone can make yeah. you bust a nut. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, no, but it's what true. I'm trying to say is like it's like I so hear that's what, what I that's what I realized that what so far as I'm getting older, it's not about her how big her butt is or no. what she's doing in bed it's not about sex to me no more it's about a connection with that person now well mm -hmm. i thought you guys were talking about when it actually gets to that, that man yeah but i mean as far as with that what shay said is very true like just to have a, a woman or whoever that that person is that you're interested in and just just talk to them go out enjoy each other's time together and just not even have to do that. And you know what yeah. I'm saying? So that, that, that is very true. That, that is connection true is where you guys exploring each other's body, yeah. exploring each other's mind. It don't have it's to just that. be, just to be about pounding it. No. Like, like, it don't have to be, <laughs> it don't have to be stuff, like, man. yeah, it don't yeah, have to be like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I hear people say sex is mandatory, has to be good. Like, nah, how do you think people are getting people are getting married before they have sex? So how how do you yeah, think they were doing things back then? So when I hear that, I don't agree with that no more. Where oh, I need to test drive the car first and blah blah blah. Yeah, that's true. Cause I know what car I like, man, and I don't care if I don't like it. I'm gonna I'm gonna force myself to like it. So man, it's in the mind. It's all a mind <laughs> thing. It's all a mind thing, man. Cause that's how I feel. Like if it's my favorite car and I get to it, and I'm like, damn. You know what I'm saying? You're like, because I've had that happen. I'm like, damn, man, yo, I really like this car, like the looks of it, but driving it, it's like, the hell? And you, and me, like me as a car guy, you know, I'm trying to, I'm like, bro, I'm going to force myself to like this shit. I'm going to put the seat back, kind of trying to do something, make it feel good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's kind of like that in the re relationship. I try to make that analogy. Like, you, you kind of, I wouldn't say force yourself, but you get acclimated to it and get used to it. If you really like it, you stick to it and, you know, get to know that person and so forth. Yeah. And FYI, nobody's perfect. So if you want, if, when girls say that or guys say that, oh, the, the sex has to be good. That person could be the asshole of your life. 
Oh yeah, my dad he, always says that it's chemistry he, over biology. Yeah, and he's throwing it down in bed, but that guy, that the nicest person, the best person for you, he's average, but he's not doing whatever. Uh, you, I guess you got you decide what you want to deal with in your life. It's your life, I guess. At the end of the day. There's somebody for everybody. Yeah. Go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you, Shay. And we're going to definitely have to do a part two with you. This is interesting. Yeah, topic. man. Oh, no. Nah, thank you guys all so much. Eh? It's been a really fun conversation, actually. I've really enjoyed myself. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I've got a, a Facebook and Instagram and all the social media stuff. That if anyone wants to check it out, um, it's just Shay Ryan Douglas primarily. Um, at shayrondoglas.com or same on Instagram. It's uh, it's really funny actually because in the in Liberated, which is on Netflix, anyone can watch it um, around the world. In the show, they uh, show my Instagram handle, which is um, underscore Shay Man underscore. And um, so upon the release of the the doco, I've received like all of these messages on a spectrum from like you're a narcissistic sociopath to like oh my god here's some nudes and i love you when when are you coming to my town kind of thing and everything in between it's been so radically different but it's been a, a huge lesson and yeah i'm open to um having conversations and chatting and and listening to, to stories and um yeah so thanks so much guys i love the work that you guys are doing with the podcast keep it up it's it's really inspiring and um yeah it can it can you know change the world thank, thank, you. You. thank you it's a pleasure yeah. having you thanks for coming yeah. on man it's for the culture podcast. Good.